Nikki, it's so nice to meet you. Um, we were actually just having a conversation beforehand and uh, you dropped some knowledge bombs that I'm gonna absolutely ask some questions about as we get started. But um, I learned about you from Patrick Nyland and he reached out to me and I listened to um, the recording that he sent, particularly one piece called Unquiet Waters by uh, Kevin Day. And wow, that, that was so impressive. And the piece just really sang to me, no pun intended, but the piece sang to me, it, it resonated with me. And in particular, what really got me also was your tone, your technique. I mean, I was just blown away. It was so awesome. So I'm so glad to have you on the Everything Sex One podcast. Well, thanks. I'm so excited to be here. I've been a big fan of the show. I've been following for a while, but thanks for the really kind words. Um, I'm really excited to chat. Oh, cool. Uh, that makes me so happy that uh, that you like the show. That's 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 great. Well, you know what? Let's do this. Let's let everybody know who you are. So if you want to, you know, um, I want to start from the beginning when you first got interested in music, because a lot of people that I've interviewed, you know, they didn't start on saxophone. They may have started on piano or something else. Um, so when you got involved with music, when you got involved in saxophone and some of your early mentors, Okay. Well, I, my musical training started like a lot of people in middle school band. I grew up in Key West, Florida, really the southernmost tip of the U.S., which actually growing up there was pretty culturally and musically diverse. And just I found myself constantly consumed by so many different types of music um, from like my mom, who's a violinist, going to orchestra rehearsals and I would sit next to the bass player. I actually remember like laying on the floor next to his bass and just like getting to listen to him playing things like that to playing in like local big bands that would play like at bars at night or on like big parades. Like that was kind of how I grew up was a lot of different genres of music. Um, so when it came time to pick an instrument, I, I chose to not play the violin because that's what my mom, that's what I had been growing up with. And I wanted to be a little different. My sister was playing violin at the time. So I picked the saxophone. Um, my early love for music, when I think of kind of what I loved about it was I felt like I had a community of people that I felt like I meshed with. Like, I felt like I found my people. And for me, music is all, has always been uh, interacting with other people and not just playing music for myself, but the, the people I surround myself with. So then I, in high school, started taking lessons um, with a pretty well-known classical player, Dale Underwood, who was teaching in at the University of Miami. So I was traveling three hours one way for lessons, which was a big sacrifice for my family. Um, if you know much about the state of Florida, you go up the whole Florida Keys and then you get to what we call the mainland. So I was traveling pretty far. Um, but what that allowed was it kind of taught me like what the college music setting was like. And I kind of decided early on that whatever music degree I get, I knew I wanted to go to college for music. And so that's kind of the path I was on uh, in high school. I did a lot of sport related activities too, and I still have a love for sports, but um, kind of more as a hobby. And um, then I, I did my undergrad at the University of North Florida and I studied classical and I also studied jazz. Um, I studied jazz with Bunky Green, who um, is pretty... A, a great jazz player and from Milwaukee, which is a city I now teach in. So it's just crazy how everything comes full circle. But then I, I went and I did my master's at the University of Illinois with Deborah Rickmeyer. And that's where um, I started to think about this idea of being a, a college professor, which was something I didn't think much of in my undergrad that that idea came more in grad school. Um, and I, that was kind of my first experience teaching other college students while being a college student, which is sometimes strange when you first start. Um, and then I had an opportunity to get my doctorate at the Eastman School of Music. So I went and did that and something I just didn't look back from at all. I just went for it. Um, and then during that time, uh, formed a quartet with some of my friends called the Fuego Quartet. And we're now a professional quartet. So we met 
as students at Eastman and we're now all doing such different things, but um, we still come together and make music, which is just so special. They're some of my best friends. And then um, I got a job at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where I teach saxophone now. Had never been to the state of Wisconsin before uh, growing up in hot, sunny Florida. And, you know, I went off to grad school in cold places, but completely had to change my wardrobe and shoveling snow is a thing. And so it's very different. I've lately tend, I, I tend to flock to cold weather, which is just so strange, but, um, luckily I still get to go back and visit Florida, but, um, that was kind of my journey. Um, it, in some ways, similar to a lot of uh, the, maybe other college teachers and professional musicians, but in other ways, it was something that was kind of just a natural process. It was something I always really enjoyed because I felt like it, I was around like my people and the people that supported me. And it's what, I don't know, made me excited to get out of bed every day was to go and practice or go, go to a gig or watch someone else's gig or go record a CD. Um, so it's just always been a huge passion of mine that ended up turning into my job, which is, I have to pinch myself most of the time. Wow. This is, this is so great. All the things you, you were talking about, like I was thinking to myself, Key West, Milwaukee. Oh my God. Freezing. <laughs> Could that be any different weather wise? Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, I went to Key West actually a couple of weeks ago for the first time in a while. Um, dying. <laughs> hot. I, I, I couldn't have picked a hotter month to go to uh, to travel there. Um, but yeah, drastically different. I came back and it was July here and it was like 65 degrees. And so that's the coldest it ever gets in the keys is 65 degrees. So it's just, um, it's very bizarre when I think about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually kind of funny when I think about it. Um, but yeah, I love Milwaukee. What's really cool is it's a city and I'm, I've always kind of felt like I was a city person. Um, so it's, it's nice to be in a city that has like a professional symphony orchestra and a lot of, a, a great jazz scene and opera and musical theater. So that's, that's, what's really cool to me. It's a really accessible city. That's pretty diverse. And, and lots of sports too. I, I, oh I love gosh. sports as well. So <laughs> go bucks. Yeah. Yeah. We have, oh yeah, totally. It's, it's awesome. And Chicago is like an hour away. So if you don't have enough sports here, you can go to Chicago. <laughs> For sure, for sure. And how is, um, I'm always curious about this too, um, especially I grew up on Long Island. I knew where all the music stores were, can hop on a train, go to Manhattan, go to, you know, great repair people, all that kind of thing. How is like the music store music repair scene around that area? It's it's pretty great. Um, so I have, you know, my go-to repair tech is actually in Pennsylvania, <laughs> um, but I have a great kind of, um, tech here that if I need little things, um, Brian Katz, he's awesome. He comes to Milwaukee like once a week and I have my students send their horns to him and I, I send my horns to him. But then in Evanston in Illinois, we have PM Woodwinds, which is pretty great too. Um, which is like a hub for all things saxophone. And so I've gone there too, and it's great. So, um, we're not too far away from a lot of great repair techs. That's good to know. And actually, a lot of people are always asking about, you know, uh, repair persons and all that kind of thing. Um, and unfortunately, like in, in the United States, we're better off. Um, and in Europe, we're better off than some of other countries. I have a student in Bangladesh, and there's nothing. There's oh, my nothing gosh. Sure. It's crazy. So when we wow. have lessons, I'm trying to help him fix things. <laughs> you That's know? so difficult. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Yep. Luckily, he his work requires him to travel to London a couple of times a year. Mm. So then he brings his horn and it goes yeah. to sax, uh, sax co. you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Place. I, I yeah. want to go there. I hear it's a candy store. So oh, it's like every saxophone player's dream, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. for sure. For sure. All right. Now I got distracted. But here's the thing. So as you said in the beginning, you were you were laying on the floor listening to the bass to the bassist. I'm thinking to myself, I'm surprised she didn't take up the bass. Yeah, I think I was a little too short. Probably. I'm only five, two. <laughs> okay, got it. But you know, I, I one of the reasons I picked the saxophone was when I was really little, my grandma used to tell me she wanted to play the saxophone, but they couldn't afford the I think it was probably 25 cents a week to rent a saxophone quote. I, I could be wrong, but you know, they didn't come from a lot of money. Um, and so my grandma would always talk about how she always wanted to play the saxophone. So that was one of the reasons I picked the saxophone. Um, 
the the middle school band program I was a part of, you could pick any instrument you wanted. I know there's some programs now where they kind of pigeonhole you into kind of like like instruments based on a variety of different things. But what I loved about our program was we could we had the option to pick any instrument we wanted. Um, and so that was an instrument that really sang to me. Um, and what was really awesome was there are a lot of female identifying saxophonists in my middle school band section, which was so awesome because as I got older, as you can guess, there were less and less of that, which was really unfortunate. And so, which is something that I see cha- that I'm, I see changing now, but, um, that was also what made me really excited to play the saxophone too. Yeah, that's, that's so important. Um, I remember growing up, I played trumpet and I'm just trying to remember. Probably similar. Oh, it was worse. Oh, it was worse because I remember um, it was in New Hyde Park and uh, the elementary school had three levels to it and the band lessons were in the attic, really Mm -hmm. hot, but there were 25 of us in a room and I think it was myself and one other young girl, Kristen. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, she, she was brilliant. She's so brilliant. Uh, but anyway, it was just us and a whole bunch of boys. And mm. it was, we were mocked because we picked trumpet, mm. you know, it was yep. back in the day. And, and it's, yep. it's disgusting to even like think about that, but that's, mm-hmm. that's what we went through. And I went through that all through elementary, junior high and high school. Um, and it, um, it just makes me so happy to see so many accomplished female musicians on instruments that were deemed, you know, uh, more for, for men as opposed to women. Yeah. I mean, it's so important to change the stereotype. And I think that comes with ads, too. And like what you see and what young girls are seeing on ads is, is you shouldn't be picking an instrument based on on what you see online. And then um, if you are everything should be more diverse and you should be able to see yourself in everything you see online. And that's why, you know, online representation is so important in what we do. Absolutely. And we're going to dig into that a little bit more, but the other thing too, I wanted to point out that you said as well, um, it also depends on what part of the country you come from because, you know, um, more rural districts, I mean, there's so, there's so many limitations there for sure, but like with band directors, and I, I know I, I, I was a band director for just about 15 years, and, you know, my thought process was, um, I luckily had the kids in general music for third grade the year before, and I got to see the tendencies of the kids, I got to see the work ethic, work ethic. I got to see, you know, how they thought their thought process, whether they match pitch really well, that was super mm. important because, you yeah. know, when you're thinking about stuff like French horn or oboe and trombone, that is so vital. You know, the, yeah. the instrument doesn't make the sound for you. Right. Um, so I was thinking about those types of things too, but band directors yeah. also think about instrumentation yeah. as well. And that will limit people's choices, um, yeah. unfortunately. But yeah. uh, luckily for you, uh, it wasn't limited. And, and did the school have instruments for you or did you have to rent? Uh, we had that option, but at the time I had this really great Yamaha student saxophone. That was my own that I used. My grandma actually bought it for me and I paid her like a hundred dollars a month. Um, and I paid it off to her. It was cool. It was like, I used my, some of my allowance to like pay her back. So they did have, they had great student instruments. I think the students that didn't own saxophones, we had Yamaha beginner level saxophones, which was really great. We had this, I think Yamaha is, is great in that way. And Selmer, um, for the opportunities they give to music educators in terms of making it accessible for students to learn. So, oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yamaha is, is I know going to NAM every year. I mean, they have a whole big, you know, uh, portion of NAM and the stuff that they're doing is just fantastic. And Yamaha instruments, great for intonation and great for ergonomics too. Yeah. And what's, I, I do quite a bit with Selmer and they've been so very supportive and um, bringing me out to a lot of different schools. Um, and just, even if it's presenting, you know, students with, you know, Van Doren is great about this too, and giving students kind of resources and things to learn, um, and to be inspired by. So I think those are things that I didn't see a lot of when I was a young student, um, in part because I was so isolated from the rest of the country, but in terms of equipment, it was, it was really fantastic. I I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I absolutely totally agree. Those are, um, those are companies, Selmer, uh, Van Doren, Yamaha, always recommend, you know, and there's so many, there's so many, and here's the other thing too, and you could definitely relate to this. Um, 
I know for me, you know, growing up, there were certain, there was only a few companies really that we knew of, you know, like for Trump, it was Bach, mm. you know, but you knew about Selmer. Um, yeah. You knew about Yamaha, although at the time, Yamaha wasn't, I remember the trumpets, sometimes those valves weren't that great. Mm. But as, as I got older, the, the instruments got better and better. Um, but there, there was Olds, there was Bundy, there was those types of things, reliable, yeah. durable equipment. But nowadays, there's so many great oh my companies yeah. that it's just, it's astounding to me, actually. It's, it's, it's almost overwhelming, but there's, there's a lot of great manufacturers, not just of instruments, but of mouthpieces, too. I've got oh, a lot yeah. of friends that are great mouthpiece makers and yeah. um you know i use the 10m fan mouthpieces and and uh mark sepanuk and it just uh, just amazing stuff and jody jazz's um mouthpieces thea Wane. i mean the, the list can just go on and on but uh before we geek out on equipment <laughs> i mean i will always geek out on equipment <laughs> and i feel like i and what's incredible is i learn about new equipment from my students it seems like every day, especially in terms of jazz mouthpieces, like I'll have students bring in these new mouthpieces that they heard about, like on Instagram. And I'm like oh, jumping on Instagram to read more about them. And it's just um, it's it's pretty cool to see. And that's it seems like that's how the students get excited a lot of times is. Um, and if if those things can ins inspire them, then I think that's fantastic. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, there, like I said, there's a lot of good quality stuff out there, which is, uh, which is really cool. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to jump back. I thought something was really interesting that you said, um, when we were talking before you mentioned that, um, you know, working with the composer, sometimes you'll improvise. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. She, so she's got a jazz background. And I was thinking, as you mentioned, you know, you know, your past, how, again, laying on the floor next to the bass player, I'm, I was thinking, okay, I'm curious why she didn't take bass. Get it. I'm only five, <laughs> three myself. So I did try bass for a while. I, 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 oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I did. I actually really liked it. Um, but yeah, I just couldn't imagine myself carrying something that was like probably what two feet taller than me, you know, probably <laughs> a foot taller than me, um, and having to lug that thing. Um, and I did take electric bass for a little bit. That was fun. But mm. um, I'm wondering how much your listening experiences when you were really young, you know, like, again, laying on the floor, listening to the bass player, big bands, orchestras, all that kind of stuff. How much of that listening experience inspired you in terms of your musical tastes and choices? Oh my gosh. I think it's like the number one inspiration to what I do now. Uh, even, you know, when I was in, when I was in high school too, I played a, quite a bit of piano and I was studying jazz piano and that's how I learned early theory that listening to a lot of jazz music and going to live music made me excited to practice. So it didn't even necessarily inspire specific things that I would perform or play. It would just inspire me to pick up the horn and practice, which was so important early, early on for me. Um, and then when I got older, it kind of made me aware of things I could choose from and kind of piece together what I wanted to play and what I wanted to do. And that's why this album is so special to me is because it's really a, a compilation of music I love and I connect to. And I felt like towards the end of school for me, grad school, I was missing that. I felt like I was starting to get pigeonholed into something. And then so when I stepped away from school and I started teaching and performing, um, I felt like I finally could take more command of every little thing I did in terms of my programming and my playing. And so this CD is just really important in that way in promoting music that I think needs to be promoted and whether it be diverse repertoire or music that hasn't been recorded enough. And so, um, yeah, that listening was really important for me. Uh, having my mom being a musician was really helpful too. Um, being a violinist, I would come home from college some summers and be practicing Bach and she would knock on my door and say, you're playing that wrong. Um, <laughs> so that was helpful too. Um, but she was always someone that um, would sit down and listen to me play, whether it be to just have a second set of ears or give me some comments or just be supportive. What was really nice, and uh, my mom would laugh at this, what was really nice is she never pushed me to be a musician either. I don't I even ask you. We never even, prob we probably never even sat down and talked about being a music major in college. That was something she just wanted me to decide on my own. And once I had decided, she was more than willing to talk and answer questions or give some feedback. She did her degree in music therapy. 
Um, so slightly different, but um, just kind of, you know, the early undergrad music curriculum is similar no matter what music degree you get. And so she was really, really helpful in that way. And um, just like very, very supportive. So it's, it's really special now she's uh, getting to see kind of what I've been doing and she's gotten to hear me play live at every stage of my life. And so she's my number one critic, but I think my number one supporter too, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. And, and you know, it's interesting too, because string players, um, especially violinists and also pianists too, their repertoire, repertoire is so extensive and it's harder. Yeah. And, you know, um, who better to speak to about playing any kind of string piece or orchestral piece than a violinist too. Yeah. So that that's mm -hmm. a great experience. A question when it comes to, and, and maybe this would be a great tip that maybe perhaps you can give to our listeners. You know, we always talk about, and I do this also, I say, you have to listen. If you want to play jazz, you have to listen. You can't just pull out the real book and think that that's jazz. You have to listen. And in my courses, I talk about, you know, how to listen. But when you're listening to jazz or you're listening to classical, what are you keying in on? What are you mm. listening to? Like what's yeah. sticking out for you that helps you to be able to, um, and let's separate this jazz from classical. So when you listen to jazz, what are you listening to that helps you to become a better jazz player? Mm. That's a good, that's a good question. I think when it comes, when I think of listening, some, if I am, if I'm thinking of transcribing, I think a lot of times I'm listening obviously to vocab, like vocabulary and what I can digest, um, which I did a lot more of when I was an undergrad. Um, but style sound is really important to me when, when I'm, that was something that I worked on a lot with Bunky was what kind of sound I wanted as a jazz player. I came from a solely classical player at the time. And so I felt kind of lost and that helped me find my way. Um, so that's, that's really important to me is sound and style, um, what I'm trying to emote, but then in terms of classical playing, it's almost the same. Like I'm listening for the same things. Um, maybe if I'm thinking of separating the two, there are different sounds I can draw from in that area and in the jazz area, but we have repertoire now that I think combined can, can be explored kind of in the middle or even like around and on top and at the bottom, if that makes sense coming in and out. Um, so I don't know. I think when I listen to both of them, it's similar in a lot of ways than maybe um, you you would expect. Um, so that is that. And I think that comes from my background quite a bit um, with my with my students. I actually do every semester we do a listening project. They have to pick eight albums to sit down and listen to and write about and talk about. And the things on there are expression and tone and style and overall um comments on the album and I don't give them any um, guidelines in terms of what type of style they have to listen to. So I'll have a student that comes in that listens to a snarky puppy album. I'll have a student that comes in and listens to three Kenny Garrett albums and then a Tim McAllister album and a Fred Hemke album. And so what's cool is that it's one, it gets me listening to more music too, because then I go and I listen to all these albums that maybe I haven't listened to, but it gets them thinking about things they should be listening for um, and kind of opening their ears up to, to some new sounds um, and new repertoire too, because then that next semester they have all these pieces they want to play and uh, solos they want to transcribe and things they want to put on recitals. And it's, it's really cool. And it was something I did as an undergrad. And the second I started doing that, I thought when I have my own students someday, we're going to do CD listening because that was huge for my education. No. Okay. This is, I have so many questions. Okay. So with, with uh, two things we were talking about, and you alluded to how pieces today, they're not strictly, I'm going to say classical, so to speak. You know, there's, there's influences from jazz, there's influences from world music. So is it for an up and coming um, saxophonist who is solely interested in classical music, is that even feasible anymore to not even, you know, listen to jazz or other styles of music like world music? I mean, I think a, a student is doing a disservice to only say, I'm going to only play this genre of music, like whatever instrument you're playing, um, in part 
because it makes you more marketable to study more than classical. I would have never gotten my job if I had only played classical saxophone. I mean, a big, when I first came to Milwaukee, I also ran the jazz ensemble. And if I didn't have that background in my undergrad, I wouldn't have had the experience to help lead a jazz ensemble. And so that, I think that's an obvious. Um, The other is that for me, it makes music so much more enjoyable if I can dig into other cultures and other backgrounds. And so, I mean, even in my doctorate, I took a class called Acoustic Africa and we learned how to play African instruments. It's probably one of the funnest and most valuable classes I ever took because not only was I learning about the music, I was learning about the culture, which I think is really important. And and I think that's what makes music also very special is that you're learning about different people, which I think is important. And so that's something that's what I think is special about teaching here at Milwaukee is we have one saxophone teacher and we that. And so the students maybe don't in some ways, I wish we had five saxophone teachers, but what's cool is the students can come in and work on things they really want to work on. And they don't just have to study classical and they don't just have to study jazz. And a lot of these students are going to be uh, music educators for the next generation. And I think that's important too, is letting your students um, allow your students to work on a variety of different things. So did that answer your question? Yeah, no, that was great. And and I'm also thinking too, so when they're listening to all these different styles of music, um, and you mentioned, you know, sound. So let's dive into that a little bit because sure. there are gonna be distinctions, um, you know, and this is gonna get also to an, into equipment as well that you mm-hmm. use when you play, well, that, that I don't know if you use different equipment for more, for more uh, you know, jazz oriented types of pieces or whatever, but, when when your students are listening to these albums, they're critiquing them. They listen to sound. I know you say you don't you don't necessarily give guidance, but do you do you give some ideas in terms of you know how are they articulating? How is it yeah. different? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I think equipment is really important. I think it's a you have a classical setup and you have a jazz setup. Um, that's always been really important for me. Um, what it, articulation is like a really really important to me. It's like something that I really like drive home to students all the time. It's probably like one of the earliest things we work on. And I've just noticed because when students come in, that's a really weak area depending on their background. Um, But in terms of uh, whether it be jazz or classical, I have them, I have students always work on similar articulation passages just for having good fundamentals. Um, But then when it comes to jazz, there's a lot of different jazz articulation patterns that I'll have students work on. And then when it comes to classical, I'll have them go through maybe a different regime. Um, And I'd say like when it comes to my current studio, I probably have like two thirds classical students, one third jazz students. And that just depends on the year. Um, But equipment is really, really important. So if the student wants to study jazz, it's okay to have maybe a stock mouthpiece for a little bit, but you need to get a jazz set up and then have a classical setup just so you kind of can differentiate between the two. And that's always been important for me um, is when I pick, I mean, just a couple months ago, I had a a new music gig where I had, there were jazz tunes and classical or more contemporary tunes. I brought both setups and that was really helpful because I want to be able to put myself in that sound and in that space. And so based on my training, that was really helpful. I could pick up my horn um, and just be able to kind of fit in that group, fit in that kind of combo setting that was more improvisatory and then pick up my soprano and play something completely different with a classical setup. And so that was really important. Um, And so when the students are listening, um, we sometimes have conversations of sometimes we'll watch, watch things too, because visual is important, but saying, see, look at the setup they're using. What are the types of setups we can pick and choose from is important. In terms yeah. of, and I'm going to get deeper into the equipment in a second. Um, you had answered my question. I'm thinking, gosh, what if she gets a piece that has, you know, jazz elements and classical elements in it? What setup yeah. do you choose? <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on the person. Um, I, I've had students in the past that if they play a, a piece that's maybe has more jazz inspiration, I'll think of there's pieces by Barry Cockroft that um, sometimes people will choose jazz setups. I fully embrace that. And I allow students to use a jazz setup and I will, I go back and forth. It really just depends on like how much jazz I had been playing at the time. And if I'm comfortable playing it on my jazz setup, or I'll just play it on my classical setup. I think there's something to be said also about 
getting a jazz sound on a classical setup and being able to manipulate your sound in the moment. I think there's players in military bands that are really good at doing that. Um, and so I think that's important too. But for me personally, I prefer to have a separate setup so I can channel that sound and I can hone my craft on that setup and then switch. Um, because, uh, that that's important for me. And I, I let my students embrace that too, if they're comfortable doing that. Let, um, let me ask you another question in terms of articulation. You talked about like a certain articulation regime for both, but also one for jazz and one for classical. What was the, what's the biggest mistake you notice for incoming freshmen um, or incoming students, even to your private studio when it comes to articulation? Is it tongue placement on the reed? Okay, oh you gosh, nodding your so head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think number one is just tongue awareness, like what's going on with the tongue. Okay. Um, and, and knowing how it engages with the read, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy for me to tell early on how, how aware a student is about their tongue just by asking questions. I'm kind of notorious for asking students a lot of questions just to see where their, their background is at. And, and I think it's an awareness of the tongue. Where's the tongue need to be inside of your mouth while you're playing. It's one of the most important aspects of playing the saxophone is being aware of your tongue. For me, that's like, night and day and how you articulate can completely change your sound. And a lot of times I'll find students are just like working way too hard. They're moving their tongue so much. And if they can rely more on the airstream and smaller tongue movement, then the sound just completely transforms and they're able to just be more free when they play. And so that is why I spend a lot of time early on with students on articulation. You know, I don't have like a set regime. I make every single freshman do from day one. I used to do that. And I found that every student is different and they have a different journey. And I have a uh, similar material for every student. But if I find like there's a certain weakness in a student's area, we kind of go in that route for a little while and we spend time there. And a lot of times it's articulation. It's probably like nine and a half times out of 10, it's articulation. Um, and then, yeah, and then so many other things are fixed in that way because they're more aware of their tongue and their tongue placement. And so things like altissimo and voicing and um, like a homogenous sound, if that's what you're going for um, in a certain genre has, is, is so much better. And so, and that just comes from my background. My undergrad teacher was really, um, really helped me a lot in that way. And it made me more free to do other things. And this brings up another thing too, um, along with articulation comes read choice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, mouthpiece choice and all that kind of thing. So let's talk about um, equipment. Let's talk about like your classical setup and then we'll ask about your jazz setup. Sure. Um, so my classical setup uh, is a little different depending on the horn. Um, on soprano, I use a concept. That's my classical. That's my classical mouthpiece. For jazz, I use a Selmer D. Um, although, so I don't play a ton of jazz soprano though, but um, those are my setups for soprano. On alto, my classical setup is a S90 180. I, uh, I really like that mouthpiece and I feel just like super comfortable on it. Um, and my, I use a three and a half size reed. I play all Van Doren reeds. Um, on tenor, I, I also use a Selmer S90. I just love those mouthpieces. I think they're really, really great. And I just feel like they fit me and my sound. Um, and then on Barry, I use the same mouthpiece, Selmer S90 180. I just think they're really great. And then for my jazz setup, um, I use V16 mouth. Uh, I use a V16 mouthpiece on alto and tenor. I, I really love them. Medium. I like to use medium chamber jazz mouthpieces because I find they fit kind of my classical setup more. I don't like things that are like just completely far away from each other. I like kind of being closer um, in the middle. And so, yeah, th those are my setups. I certainly live in my classical setup a lot more than my jazz setup. So I think that's why I like the V16 mouthpieces a lot is because I can pick up my horn and I just feel like I'm really comfortable on it. And it's not something that's like all the way out in Timbuktu compared to my classical mouthpiece. But I've changed a lot over the years. When I was younger, I just used a Selmer C-Star. And then when Selmer came out with the S90s, I really liked them. Um, and then on soprano, I just, I love the concepts and anyone I talk to that plays a concept loves them too. And some of my favorite players play them. So, um, 
I, I tend to have a harder setup on soprano, which I think some people think is strange, but for me, that's always, I felt I needed that. I need that kind of pressure on the horn. Um, and I'm like for years have been kind of a soprano player. That's like, I'm like a very much a classical soprano player. That's, I live a lot in that world. And, um, but my setup is pretty different than on alto, which I think sometimes is a little strange, but, um, that's kind of what has felt home to me, like home to me. So, yeah. This is going to lead right into uh, tone because in listening to your, um, your latest album, which is called absent light, right? Uh, unquiet waters. Oh, it is unquiet waters. I was looking at, hmm. I was looking, okay. That's what I, I, whoops. That's what I initially thought. Um, sorry for that ding there. That's oh, what I totally initially fine. thought. And then I was looking at, at the, um, the promo materials. I'm like, wait a minute, hold on a second. What did I get wrong here? Okay. So when listening to Unquiet Waters, and it's particularly that, that piece by Kevin Day, man, your tone, incredible. So I think it was helpful that you shared your equipment, um, you know, your setups and stuff like that. But now let's dive into tone and your concept of tone. Um, let's say this, every day that you practice, and you know you're working on your tone what are you thinking about what's going on in your mind what are you looking for it's funny you ask that because i used to get asked this question when i was younger and i hated it and now i love that question <laughs> because i felt like when i was younger it was really hard to answer i was like oh it's just an extension of who i am it's just like i pick up the horn and that's what i sound like when i was younger it was like such a naive way of thinking but i think about it a lot now and it's it has to do with how i warm up like a lot about how I warm up has, it's like an extension of who I am. So when I warm up, it's like a very creative process because I'm trying to listen to myself, but a lot of it comes down to practicing intonation. I spend a lot of time working on intonation, which I think is, is another way to have, to work towards having a good sound, a great sound is intonation. And that's been key for me, especially in the last probably four to five years. And it's changed my sound quite a bit. Um, so that is a huge core component to my warm up, and then also vibrato. And I practice my vibrato quite a bit in terms of thinking about my sound. Um, and that has been huge. And, you know, I've had teachers that have been it, big influences in my sound as well. But I think how I warm up, working on intonation and lots of long tones um, has helped my sound quite a bit. And then recording myself and reflecting, which I think we tend, when we're younger, we try, we, we are hesitant to do. And that was something that not only teachers pushed me to do quite a bit. I just did because, uh, I didn't like my sound for a really long time. And so I would listen back, I would change and tweak my warm up, And then I would do some more recordings and just more, more performing and recording and reflecting helped, helped quite a bit. So my inspiration really just comes from working on intonation and vibrato and warming up, like having a really good warm up helps a lot. Um, so that's been key. Can you share one uh, particular intonation exercise? I know you mentioned long tones, so I'm, I'm going to ask two questions here. Yeah. When you're playing long tones, how are you playing them? What are you thinking about? And then is there another intonation exercise that you normally do? Yeah, that's a good question because I always give a talk on, uh, it's called be more specific about your long tones. <laughs> So um, a really easy, you know, a lot of my warm up is not written down. I mean, I've written it out now for my students, but uh, a lot of times it first for me always starts with the mouthpiece because I think the mouthpiece is an extension of this. It, it is literally um, making the saxophone smaller. And I always tell my students, if you can sound good on the mouthpiece, you can sound great on the horn. Um, so it starts with the mouthpiece, but um, a great exercise I like to do is I always, I put a drone on quite a bit. Um, and I smart, I start with really small intervals, uh, say I'm using, I'm in the key of C and I'll start in thirds and then in fourths and I'll go really, really slow to hear those intervals and then I'll improvise. And so once I've kind of set that tonality, then I'm free to improvise, um, and it just allows me to hear more. And then as I start to warm up more, I might turn the drone down so I can hear my sound even more. And then I start to add in vibrato and, and vibrato exercises I might do that day. But the drone is constantly on when I practice. And I use a qu quite a lot of like low drones in terms of frequency. I love the tuning CD, but sometimes it's a little too high in the morning. Uh, I've, I've certainly used it quite a bit, but um, kind of low drones. It's a very meditative process in a lot of ways. Um, but 
that that's really good for me is just basic interval exercises with a drone. And every time I warm up, I pick three keys and I go through those three keys. Uh, and that process usually takes like 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and some days it takes 10, some days it takes longer than that. It depends on like, if I had, I played a lot the day before, if I didn't play at all the day before. Um, but that's been huge for my sound. I mean, that completely changed my sound when I was in my master's was when I started working on that, uh, and being more specific about my long tones. Um, and then from there I might do, um, like basic articulation exercises, or I'll go do voicing exercises, but interval intervals are really, really key. It's at slow, slow tempos, um, like metronome, not even needed, um, so that you're listening and your ears opened up. And, and if a, if a student has like an altissimo register is to embrace the altissimo register in your warm up. Like I, I think it was maybe Adam Larson talked, spoke about this once. I love Adam and he's a good friend and I've brought him to campus before, but I think it was him that mentioned, you know, you've got to start practicing your altissimo. It's got to start being in your warm up if you want to improve on it. You can't just expect for it to happen. And so that is like a hundred percent something I think about all the time. Um, and that that's been really important for me. And you know, um, this is so great that you're sharing all this. And, and I'm curious when you say the drones, you say low sounding drones, what do you use? Like I often rec recommend like organ drones there. Um, I also use the tonal energy yep. um, app. You can create drones there and you can put them in a lower register, but what do you use in particular? Yeah, The cello drones are really great. You can even find them on YouTube. Those cello drones I, I find are a really great frequency. Um, so those are really great. I have, you know, it's funny. I have like a, an album of what's called low drones that were given to me from my undergrad teacher. And to this day, I have no idea where this album is from, but I use those and they sound pretty similar to cello drones, but I think the cello drones are really great. There's a couple apps that you can actually, you can choose any octave drone, which I think is really great. I think well, energy does, um, does that, but, um, I, I, the the anything that's a low drone like i always tell students just pull up youtube and go to cello drones um and i think those are really great too um are you aware of um the walter white cd now i know this from brass and what's interesting what you said um in terms of um uh like warming up and and long tones and stuff like that you, you had mentioned something and it just escaped me and it's a very brass like way of thinking but um the Walter White CD is this really nice drone CD. It's it's uh, chord progressions for the most part, but you could play like, for example, on the concert B flat track, you could play uh, the root and the five and mm. it'll sound fine throughout the whole 20 minute track. Mm. Um, but the chords change and then there's a bridge section in the middle where it, it goes to like a minor type of tonality. But the idea when you mentioned that you improvise also, that immediately made me think of the Walter White CD. Yeah, I do not know that, and I need to get it. <laughs> I'm gonna send. The, I'm gonna That's send that awesome. info, info. Yeah, let me write that down. I'm gonna send that info um, to you. And you know what? I'll put a link in the show notes for everybody. Cool. Um, this is not easy to get. It's it's a little bit pricey. Mm -hmm. um, if I remember right, it's on Amazon. It's probably it should be on iTunes also. Um, I think it's worth it because it's beautiful, mm, yeah. beautiful backgrounds. It's like a jazzy type of background, but. Yeah. You could play your B flat and F concert pitch, or there's there's different keys on this thing. Yeah. It's probably um, uh, let's see, it's an hour, it's an hour and twenty minutes, if I'm not mistaken, of drones. But I think the last twenty minutes, Walter White, who's a trumpet player, yeah. uh, improvises freely, improvises. Ah. So it gives you some ideas, yeah, about doing I mean, that. Talk about uh, like the absolute most creative way to be or talk about the most creative you could be in a warm up. I mean, I think sometimes students think like time to warm up, time to pick up my horn, play long tones for the day. But like for me, it's like, all right, I get to warm up time to improvise time to sound good. Like it's just a lot of times it's like the first thing we do that day, like pick up the horn, play long tones. But that is like a great way to start the day too, which is like what I tell my students, pick up your horn, do some of this before you go to 8 a.m. theory class, and then you're warmed up and you're ready to go to your lesson. So that's been pretty, pretty great for them and for me too. That's a great way of putting a positive spin on something that most people um, don't want to spend any time on tone. All they oh, want yeah. to do is want to work on patterns or they want to play higher, things. faster, louder. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and the opposite of that. 
Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, actually doing this helps you to play yes. louder, uh, higher, um, not necessarily faster. That's something different, but you know, it right. certainly helps you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny how those things come full circle. <laughs> It, it does. And it actually curious too, because as a brass player, I know we all, I call it warming down, but actually that doesn't make sense. That's what cool I've been told. Cool down. I call yeah, it cool, cool down. down. Yeah, yeah. Cool down makes more sense. Do you do that? Yeah, I do do that. Um, what, what I've been doing lately is I do more, I'll pull the mouthpiece off and do mouthpiece exercises as a cool down just to make sure um, I haven't lost what I started with. So that's been really key for me. And I do a lot of breathing exercises when I cool down too, and stretching away from the horn. That's very important for me too, as someone who, what was that? You, you do that at the end as opposed to the beginning. That's interesting. I do it, I do it at the beginning too, but oh, okay. as someone who also likes to run, um, I, I know how important it is to do that at the beginning and the end. Um, something else I've learned from my mom, cause my mom, is a runner. Um, and so that is important for me for playing too, especially now that I'm getting older, I won't say my age. Um, and I feel my body, um, can't, can't hold up to what it used to do. Um, I I'm trying to be more self-aware of my body and just making sure I'm keeping it healthy and that's here and that's like all over. And so that's really, really important too. I think it's actually impressive that you're able to run in Milwaukee. What do you do in the winter time? <laughs> I use a treadmill in the winter time. Okay, I was going to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, my my limit is like once it's below thir 35 degrees, I can't breathe. I, I don't know. You know, people run in ice here. Like they have those attachments on their shoes and I I just can't. I will like break something. So, um, yeah, winter time I run on a treadmill. Um, <laughs> there's no shame in that. Yeah. There's no shame in that. There's no shame at all. I mean, I, I can't take, yeah. I can't take the winters. That's why I moved. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. No, I want to get back to the mouthpiece for a second. So interestingly enough, um, that's what I was referring to. That's right. With the brass on brass. Um, we always, some people warm up by buzzing the lips. You don't need to do that for saxophone folks. Um, <laughs> you don't, but, no. um, but we, I know for me, I'm always warming up on the mouthpiece. And if I can't, you know, if I'm like traveling to a gig or something like that, um, or I'm on a long trip, <laughs> hopefully no policemen are listening to but listen to this but i'm more i'm buzzing my mouthpiece as i'm driving oh, yeah. you know i because yeah. that's the great exercise to do but saxophone mouthpiece a lot different on brass um as vince pensarella taught me if you if you first of all if you're not hearing it you're gonna have a hard time but if you can't mm -hmm. play it on the mouthpiece it ain't coming out the horn you yeah. know you got to be able to play on the mouthpiece it's not necessarily the same for saxophone because of the limitations there you can't mm -hmm. be able to play a concerto on a mouthpiece right so like in terms of like range and flexibility on the mouthpiece what are you looking for from your students when it comes to that yeah i think what's first important for me is why why we're doing it everything everything i do i have to think about the why Otherwise, one, I'm less motivated to do it. And two, it's less likely it's going to fix a problem I'm trying to isolate. And so the first thing is what kind of core pitch we're trying to achieve and always coming back to that core pitch. And on alto, for me, that's an A. I know some jazz players like to do G or lower than that. Um, but if I'm, we're focusing on concert classical playing, I'm fo we're focusing on an A. And so making sure that fundamental is sound is really important for me uh, at a loud dynamic. And so I think sometimes we can cheat that at a soft dynamic, but being able to do that at a loud dynamic and hitting it right away is really important. A lot of students, sometimes students tend to hit it too high, which reveals a lot of things. And uh, it's funny, I compare it to like string playing where they, they practice quite a bit with the bow and bow control and the sound coming from the bow at times. So I think of like our mouthpiece almost as like the bow on a string instrument, but being able to hit that A and then learning how to be flexible, but coming back. And so it goes back to that tongue position for me and making sure we have not only the right oral cavity, but the tongue is up in the back to get to get that pitch. And then it kind of comes down like a slide. And so when we're thinking of 
doing pitch bending exercises, coming back to that A is really important. And a lot of times in lessons, if students having difficulties, I'll say, pop off the mouthpiece and let's hear what pitch you're playing. And they're likely like hitting a C and not an A, which yeah. means you're too tight on the mouthpiece. You need to open up more and think of a fast airstream, but you've got to be open. A lot of times we'll tell students faster airstream and then they tense up everything else, which is like this stays relaxed. It's the airstream that carries the sound and so that is that's pretty important so that's why the mouthpiece is like crucial number one I mean just this week I've been working with a great group of high school students as they prep for a marching band season and we've spent so much time on mouthpiece pitches at the beginning every day and the group sound is completely transformed and now uh they love going home and practicing their mouthpiece pitches and I'm sure their parents hate them for it um and the dogs (laughs) oh yeah absolutely uh, the funny thing is when I play mouthpiece pitches, my dog just kind of goes, Ooh. oh, I'm really confused. So maybe I looked out in that way, but my, did, cat does, did. my cat does not like it. Um, so yeah, that's it's saxophone playing for me is sometimes like the core is at the mouthpiece. And so, yeah, I've sat in my car and practiced mouthpiece exercises and I've learned a lot of, a lot of techniques, a lot of extended techniques I've learned with just the mouthpiece and the neck. So learning how to double tongue, learning how to slap tongue. I spent one car ride where I, that's how I learned how to double tongue was my mouthpiece on the neck circular breathing. I learned how to circular breathe with the mouthpiece and neck. So, um, even at the advanced level, kind of breaking it down in that way in chamber music playing and like the quartet setting all four just playing on the neck is really helpful for matching articulation. Wow. Um, so, oh yeah, I could talk about the mouthpiece forever. Wow. No, this is, this is so incredible. And you know what, since you mentioned the quartet, let's talk about that. I, I got to ask a question first though. Um, so you, you went to Eastman, right? For your doctorate. Um, did you have a chance to, uh, meet or study with Chris Azara? Ah, uh, uh, so I did not take a class with him, okay. but he was actually on my oral oral committee when I finished when I finished my degree. Um, and I also did a certificate in college music teaching, um, kind of in addition to uh, the my minor and my degree. And he helped kind of advise that. So I did get to interact with him quite a bit. He's such a special human being, um, like every every member of the music teaching learning uh, faculty there is just really, really great. And he's, he's one of them. So kind of, um, I I definitely, uh, definitely have gotten to work with him. I wish I could have taken a class with him. That was the one thing I really wanted to do, but he's really great. He is great. And he's the one that got me interested and into music learning theory. So I'm wondering if any of that spilled into your doc, I don't know if it would have spilled into your doctoral studies at all. Well, I did my minor in pedagogy. So I took some, I t- and that was really came from, I wanted to be more involved in the music education area when I was at Eastman. And um, so it, it's funny, I, t- I took a course on teaching instrumental methods. And so since then I've changed a lot of how I teach methods classes. Me too. And when I, when I came, yeah, it, and it was so fantastic. And um, I use those, uh, I use the jump right in books now um, mm-hmm. as a part of the methods courses here. When I came to Milwaukee, I taught the, uh, the methods courses, but now I have a TA. So it's kind of a, um, I'm happy about it, but also not. I have a now I have a grad program. And so my, one of my grad students teaches the course, but we use the jump right in material and I, I, I help them through that, but, oh my gosh. Yeah. Huge inspiration on, on teaching methods for me and the students thrive. I've found the students thrive in that scenario. Um, it's, and it, it brings the best out of them, I think. Oh my gosh, for sure. And just to give everybody just a a little bit of a background here. So um, Dr. Edwin Gordon founded Music Learning Theory. He's, he was unfortunately passed away within the last few years. The nicest guy. I went to a bunch of the conferences. I met with him. I ate lunch with him. Mm -hmm. Great person. And um, I know a bunch of the folks at Eastman. I took a course with Chris at Hart School of Music summer course. Totally changed my music life in terms of playing and teaching. It yeah. blew my mind because the way music learning theory is, it's it's how jazz musicians learn by ear. We're developing our ears first. Yes. It's it's ears before eyes, sound before yeah. sight. And everybody that has studied, you know, those concepts, those ideas, um, they thrive, like you said, 
because you know we we need to build the oral experience and the shame of of music education in our country and really in in many parts of the world is that we're developing the sight before yes. the sound they think yeah. literacy is reading as opposed to honestly real literacy is improvisation yeah and when you think of a young child they're learning to speak before they learn how to write so what i've really appreciated about it is the students one are getting to play sooner they're getting yeah. to play music they really enjoy but two their sound develops so much more quickly and this idea of improvisation and freedom is something that's just the norm which has not become the norm was not the norm when i was in middle school band and it's i remember sitting when i took it sounds like a similar course with um kathy liberotti who's oh, fantastic yeah. fantastic human being um I just kept thinking to myself this whole time, what would have my journey been like if my <laughs> my education was like that at a younger age? And um, it too. was fantastic because some days I just felt like a middle school band kid in that class kind of going through the journey again. And I I loved it. It was great. It's yeah. eye opening. It's humbling. Like when we mm -hmm. had to do certain tonal patterns in like Dorian. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 oh, my the, gosh. Yeah. Oh, it, it, OK, so I think I took a course. Uh, I, I got certified music learning theory many years ago. Oh, and okay. Michael Martin and Diane Lang, Dr. Diane mm. Lang. Oh, she's she's a gem. Um, so we'd be doing these tonal patterns. And we're sitting there and then the rhythm patterns and triple division rhythm patterns oh, and we're, yeah. we're and dying clapping and oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh. yeah well, i'm you know, like reliving this whole class now yeah oh it's, my gosh it's cool now again people that are peaking getting their interest peaked the jump right in series of, of books um they are accessible through gia publications however i have to warn you it's not i'm going to say it, it's not user friendly you do need a teacher to guide you through it um yeah. because it um uh, it, it requires a teacher that has music learning theory, understanding and training. It's not mm -hmm. so, a, a book you could pick up and be like, okay, what do I do? You know, you don't know what to do next. Although yeah. there is a CD that, you know, is very helpful. It, it, go, it goes through tonal patterns. It, it, um, they sing through, and actually Lisa Cole was the person that sang through a lot of that stuff, at least for oh, some of the instrumental wow. stuff. I went to Saratoga with her New York State Summer School for the Arts, she, clarinet oh player. Gosh. She was a phenomenal clarinet player. And so she's also a great singer too. She, she was the person that sang on those CDs. Um, but you know, it's not as user-friendly as you think, but if you are interested in this, um, contact me or um, contact Nikki, actually. Yep, absolutely, you know, yeah. De definitely, we're gonna put your contact info in here, but mm -hmm. it's really, um, it will change, it changed my life in terms of teaching and in terms of learning. You know, and, and same yes. question you just said, man, I wish I was taught this way when I was young, because yeah. what could I have become, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, from studying that way? But um, yeah. I had to digress because I, I had to ask <laughs> that question, but let's talk about your quartet work. <clears throat> with the Fuego Quartet and how y'all formed, but also more importantly, you know, like the types of music that you perform. And you said something very interesting, how, you know, when you are rehearsing, um, you guys do some work on mouthpiece and neck. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's intriguing to me. Yeah. So we formed as four brand new graduate students at Eastman. We had come from all different places in the country. Um, the alto player and I had both come from the same program, but different degrees. And then we had a player coming from Indiana and a player coming from Georgia. And so we knew each other, but we weren't really like, I mean, we were just acquaintances at that point, I think. And um, day one of school, we just like meshed really well, which I think sometimes is rare in a quartet. I mean, at that point, that was like year six of college for me. Um, which is already a lot if you think about it. Um, and I had not yet really felt that way about a quartet like that special. And um, really, our first year together was kind of just foundational. We played a lot in the community, which we tell uh, of everyone today was like the biggest, the number one, like, element of our success early on was we just got out and played. We played a lot in the community um, at like museum gatherings or like uh, things as a part of the university, but at different venues in the area, just playing and making mistakes on the fly and just learning how to like recoup and um, make each performance better. And then that next year we won some, uh, a lot of the pretty major 
uh, chamber music competition. So that kind of like set the stage for us. And we weren't expecting that at all, Um, which I think is maybe one of the best ways that happens is that we just went out and had fun. And at the end, we we had a lot of success in the competition circuit. Um, And then we all went to different areas and kind of had to learn how to be a professional group. And um, we had a lot of help with with mentors that um, kind of guided us to take a business model and figure out what each of our strengths were. Cause, um, I don't like handling money, but our baritone player does. So he makes, it makes more sense that he is the treasurer. Um, and I like talking to people and networking. So it makes more sense that I take a different role. And so that was really, really helpful in, in that way. And, um, we recorded an album, which you can, you can download and stream, kind of in every major platform it's called migration and um it's kind of a deconstruction of the saxophone so it starts with something very tonal one of david mislinka's quartet's recitation book and then um you can we kind of take the saxophone and ter- turn it upside down and it's william albright's fantasy etudes and then a piece that was written for us called ornithology s that explores a lot of different sounds on the saxophone um specifically related to like uh bird sounds and fluttering and it's inspired by uh an art piece that's similar to like a flip book when you're young and you're flipping through and you kind of see thing images form and it's this beautiful piece of art by Juan Fontanine and um it's it's a great piece and so it really takes us it takes you the listener on a journey that's very tonal that kind of expands into something very different um at the end and um yeah and then in a couple weeks we're all going to play in one of our members weddings and it's i couldn't think of something more special and so um it it's pretty cool that we've now kind of lived through transition from being students into our careers and we're all two of us are college professors, but the other two, um, kind of one's a military musician and one is also in higher education, but it's cool to kind of see how we've all kind of grown, but we're still making music together and they're like some of my best friends. So it's really cool how it's, um, we've been able to just kind of start to play together as students and now, um, be a huge part of each other's lives. I'm curious. Okay. Um, how often forgetting about the pandemic because i'm gonna ask about that in a second but how often do you get together to rehearse Ah. because you can't all be in the same area no so yeah it's an interesting question because um we went from rehearsing every like 10 to 12 hours a week to having gigs and not being able to rehearse till like the day before so the foundation we had was really important what, what we do that's really helpful that I know other groups do as well is we have these like marathon rehearsal uh, weekends where we might block out three days. And in the past, it's been like at my parents' house and we rehearse in a basement and we just rehearse like eight, 10, even 12 hours a day for three wow. days. And then we go our separate ways. And then when we have a gig, we get together and it just clicks. Wow. And I, I really think that's because when we were students, we set up really solid foundation together and we know each other so well as people that will have these like marathon rehearsals. And then we can go play a gig and maybe it's not quite like what it was when we were rehearsing every single day together. We're able to still be a really successful group and play some difficult pieces. Um, for for audiences and have fun so yeah it's been different what's that foundation that you talk about that you was it um did you all know how to establish a foundation or was it the mentor teacher that guided you i think it was a lot of different things we all came from very different backgrounds and we brought in our own expertise which um was really, really cool because we fed off each other for that. But it was also our mentors, um, Chen Quan Lin, who's the one of the saxophone professors, the classical saxophone teacher at the Eastman School of Music, who's uh, a mate has been an amazing mentor to me and our our ensemble um, really helped us quite a bit. Um, he pushed us a lot in terms of intonation and having a good warm up as a quartet. Um, and we still use some of those elements today. Something that we started doing, um, was one day a week, every Friday, we would spend an hour just on fundamentals as a quartet, which I don't think happens enough, especially with students. We didn't have repertoire. And sometimes we would just bring our mouthpieces and our neck to these rehearsals and we would just practice. I mean, if you have, uh, 
um, four members of a quartet and they all play just the necks and the mouthpieces, it's three roots and a third. So you can make a consonant, you can make a, a harmony uh, with just rehearsing on the necks. And I do this a lot with my students, but we would practice articulation. We would practice cueing, cutoffs. That was really, really crucial for us. And we still talk about this today that that, um, that, that really um that was the ticket for us was that every friday i think at 10 or noon we would do that for about an hour and then we might rehearse or we might go get coffee together and then go off to class but um that was really helpful because then we didn't have that baggage of repertoire and having to worry about repertoire and what gig or what concert or competition was coming next we could just like refocus and it was nice that it was on a friday i think that was really really great too it was kind of the end of the week um, and we could just kind of like reset. So that was really, really great. And then just rehearsing a lot. We had to commit to this being our focus. A lot of us prior to that were soloists and we had to reset. I'd say, I'm going to equally commit to this quartet as I am my solo career and everything else I have going on. So I'm going to fully commit to this. I'm going to commit to, uh, playing a new horn like I had not played that much soprano before so I was going to practice my soprano just as much as my alto repertoire same with the tenor player the baritone player usually the alto player has already had a lot of alto foundation but also just practicing the repertoire and you know making sure that's a part of my daily practice too so that was huge as both the group's commitment but the individual commitment to that group has been um huge so two two things I wanted to ask um One's going to be about equipment and one is going to be, uh, let me ask the rhythm question. So the first question is going to be essentially, um, did you, you did one hour of like fundamentals each Friday and that that's actually great because what people don't realize you have to practice cueing, you have to practice, yeah. you know, um, you have to, it's like a baseball team. It's like, it's like any team, right? Mm -hmm. It's a team sport. You yeah. all have to get along. You all, you know, you all are a team on that stage. You've got to work together, but yeah in term did you do any kind of like rhythm work you know like um uh how do i want to word this a lot of people um they get lost in the music because they're not feeling subdivisions and stuff like that mm -hmm. but did you do any kind of like rhythm work together oh yeah well one is we have the metronome on quite a bit constantly almost like when we we knew what rehearsals we were walking into that were um, it was like a metronome themed day so always 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 we would do rhythm rhythm exercises like i remember trying to fit like um, quintuplets in a beat and um, kind of fitting in mixed meter passages because a lot of the repertoire we play not only do we have to have good great pulse it's we have pretty individualized parts so we have to be really solid with our rhythm not only individually but then when we put it all together and so that that was something we spent a lot of time with we had the met, we used the metronome like at nauseum and it was really really helpful for us in that way and making sure we were really great in time and we always kind of we we would have like our go-to metronome like clicker so if we knew we needed to turn it on we had it ready at the go hooked up to a sound system and that was important okay. the other thing we did that helped with rhythm was score study like we do that now as a group because we can't rehearse a lot together as we'll have like uh, Zoom meetings where we go through the score together and we score study. And then when we're in person, we'll sometimes maybe put the score up on a projector and we'll read off the projector together or we'll read off the score um, as a group. And sometimes we'll never move, move on to parts. We'll just always read off a score, which is really, really helpful. Yeah. And actually, um, yeah, before I get to the equipment, because I was going to ask this too, with regard to the pandemic, how did you guys deal with that Zoom meetings, score reading? Did you do, um, yeah, a lot of people got into the, to the trend, I'll call it a trendy thing, but, you know, people would record their parts and then someone yeah. would put it together and stuff like that. We did that thing. We, um, we actually had a pretty big gig in the middle of the pandemic at the Music Teachers National Association Conference where we had to premiere a piece. Oh, um, and gosh. you can find it on YouTube. It's a really fantastic piece. Um, and we had to piece that together. And not only was that a brand new piece for us, the rhythm and the meter was actually pretty difficult. So the composer made a click track for us, which was really, really fantastic. Um, and we, what was nice about that project was that was put together for us. We didn't have to do that 
But what the pandemic allowed us to do, which we had not gotten to, was after our album came out, we had some really great donors. And we um, if you donated a certain at a certain tier, you were guaranteed an arrangement. We were going to record an arrangement for you. So we had three or four pieces to arrange that we hadn't yet. And we had the time to do so. So we did do those arrangements and our tenor player put them together. He mastered it. He learned a lot about editing audio. And that was great. So um, we did a movement of Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Um, We did a vocal piece and we did uh, a couple other pieces and that was fun. So we did do that thing. Um, And uh, what I always say to students too, is um, what I liked about that was it, it's, it taught us a lot about editing and mastering audio. So for that reason, I really liked it. Um, But I'd be okay with not seeing panels of people again mashed together or maybe for a little while uh more in-person things but yeah so that was that was interesting um but uh we luckily figured out how to do it and we we're all really excited to do it so that's cool that's that's a great way to adjust and now the other question i had um some people feel you know and and i think i pretty much know the answer from you but some people feel in their studios all their students have to play the same brand of mouthpiece the same even the same strength of reed and stuff like that but um when it comes to quartet playing are you all using similar equipment yeah yeah so that's a really good question um we are really thankful to be van a van doren ensemble so we do play on van doren equipment and so we try to really match that together. We didn't do that before. Um, so that was an adjust, but, uh, every, I just, I can't speak more highly about equipment that comes from Van Doren. I think it's so consistent. Um, so we do, um, I know some, uh, some ensembles only play on like that same specific, um, model mouthpiece as well. Um, we don't go like that specific. Um, but like, I know some, only play on Selmer Sea Stars and think and things like that. So um, in terms of that, we're not quite specific with my students. I always say if you can sound great on it and it's not limiting you, then I think it's a good mouthpiece because I'm not I don't ever want someone to go and say, oh, that's a Nikki Roman student because it sounds like Nikki Roman. Like I I, I never want I, I would love for a student, a student to be inspired by my sound, but I don't want them to think that's the only sound that they can achieve from the horn. And so, um, I'm really open to equipment with students, as long as it's a good piece of equipment, it's in good working condition. Cause that is a factor like no chip mouthpieces or chipped reeds. Um, but as long as it's a good piece of equipment and it's in good working condition, then I think that's, that's really, really important. What's been really great about working with Van Doren and Selmer is they're really great about, um, sending me equipment for students to try and trial. And that's been, I'm so thankful to them for that. And with our methods courses, they donate reeds for, for the saxophones and the clarinets. Um, so they don't have to go out and buy reeds for their methods courses and even like reed cases and pencils. That's been like so fantastic. So my gosh, yeah. In terms of outreach and in terms of education, uh, the educational component beyond everything else, which is also fantastic. They're, they're really, they've been a great resource for the students and myself too. Oh my gosh, for sure. And yeah, Van Dorn is such a fantastic, uh, fantastic resource, fantastic company. And uh, many people that I've interviewed absolutely use Van Dorn products for sure. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump back to the quartet for a second because people will want some links um, so sure. is there is there a website for the quartet? Yeah, fuegoquartet.com. Um, you can buy our album, you can stream our album, you can see, um, you can read more about the group, uh, things things we've been up to, projects we've been involved in. So that that's all right there, kind of on that website. You can stream the album on Spotify, um, iTunes. It's on Amazon. It's also through Parma Recordings and Ravello Records, which is what my album is uh, going to be produced under. And so that's kind of how I got involved with them, uh, working with them for my first solo album is I had worked with them before um, for our quartet CD. So that's been kind of a cool project to kind of go through again, but kind of more on my own. Got it. Okay, cool. And so at, at FuegoQuartet.com, are there also links to like Facebook, Instagram, and yep. all that kind of thing on there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So right at the bottom, there's a bunch of all the social media things. Okay, YouTube. great. Yeah, that's good to know. And then um, any future projects for the quartet? 
Uh, not at the moment where one member just uh, is transitioning into professional life and another is getting married. So actually where we do have a gig, but it's at one of their weddings in a couple of weeks. So that's uh, at the moment, kind of the project where we're working on as we kind of support one of our members in their married life. So, yeah, that's cool. Okay. So you have a new album out on quiet waters. And so where can we get it? Um, you know, give us some links, tell us about it. Yeah, so you can check it out on really any major streaming platform, um, Spotify, iTunes. Uh, You can purchase it on Amazon, on Ravello Records, but kind of any place you listen to music, you can find it and it'll be there. Okay, cool. And we know about uh, the title of the album. We know about the title piece. Can you talk about some of the other pieces on there? You have a Leonard Bernstein piece on there as well. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk about that. You know, I didn't have originally go out to have a theme for this album, but I had worked with Kevin Day on his piece on Quiet Waters, and I felt like it was such uh, a central, uh, I thought it was such an important component of the album that it was kind of a no brainer. It was going to be the title of the album. Um, and so the Leonard Bernstein piece was a really special project because I had worked with the Hal Leonard, uh, the fantastic organization, Hal Leonard. Um, they're actually right in Milwaukee. I had done a couple projects with them, um, and they approached me about making a version of the, the clarinet sonata for alto saxophone. And I said, absolutely. I think that would be a fantastic addition to our repertoire. And so then I premiered it at a NASA conference, um, actually the last in-person NASA conference in March, 2020. Um, and then it, it, really made sense to record it. I wanted there to be a professional recording. So it was accessible for students and professionals. And now that the, you can purchase the, the music, I thought that was important. And, uh, so the Leonard Bernstein Foundation approved the project, and that's been really, really great. Um, there's also a piece on there called Floating Bones, which you'll hear me singing and playing, which is really, really fantastic. And it was written by a really good friend of mine. And what's even more special is that she was a student at UW-Milwaukee at the time, which is where I teach. And she wrote me a piece called Floating Bones. And her music, if you check it out, Olivia Kiefer, is so rhythmically interesting and pushes you as a performer. It's both exhausting and exhilarating to listen to. Uh, Well, to perform, it's exhausting and exhilarating. To listen to, it's exhilarating. Um, But so, so much fun. Uh, Pushed me a lot to, I had not recorded anything singing before. So you will be the first to hear that. (laughs) Um, So that's on there, Floating Bones. Uh, Let's see, what else is on there? Oh, there's a really fantastic piece called Cadenza by Lucy Robert. And uh, she's contributed a lot to the saxophone, uh, but her music has not been recorded enough, in my opinion. So there weren't a lot of recordings of this piece, but I consider it a standard in our repertoire. So that's on there. Uh, A piece called Bug, which is an unaccompanied piece for solo saxophone, which actually was my doctoral research project. Um, So I did a lot of uh, kind of a theoretical analysis on that piece. And so I finally got to record that. There's not a lot of recordings of that piece. Um, And then, oh, and the very last one is on there for my family. It's my own arrangement of Edvard Grieg's um, Wedding Day at the Trolled Haugen, which is a small uh, or short character piece for piano that I arranged for soprano and piano. And so that kind of uh, rounds out the album. And so um, that's a piece I've been playing for a long time. And I thought to myself, I want this album to be something that anyone can sit down and listen to it and enjoy it. And so that one is really for my family and um, my life at this point, lifelong collaborator, Casey Dearlam Che is the pianist on the album. And she's someone that there's a cup there's a one piece on here that we've been playing it was our very first piece we played together so getting to go through this process with her has been really special she's uh i've learned almost just as much from her as i have from any saxophone teacher i've ever had she's pushed me as a performer she's now come to milwaukee a bunch to play with my students and so um having her here in milwaukee to record it was really great and so i really think there's everyone there's anyone can sit down and listen to this. And I think they'll enjoy something on it. That's, that was my goal. And then the, the album theme unquiet waters is, you know, being from Florida, that was really special to me was having some kind of water connection 
there's um you can read that the Leonard, Leonard Bernstein's clarinet sonata, that parts of that melody he wrote when he was on vacation in Key West and being from Key West, that was pretty special to me. Um, and so, yeah, this was just it's funny. It started at the beginning of the pandemic and it really turned into my pandemic child. It was like my project that now is finally coming out. So it was pretty cool. And my quartet mate is the producer on the album, Gabe PK. He's the baritone player in my quartet. And so that was really special. The recording engineer is a mastermind, Rick Probst. He's like the go-to recording engineer in Milwaukee. He's amazing. I've gotten to do other projects with him now. So um, yeah, I'm super excited for it. You know what's what's interesting? There's a lot of full circle stuff here. You mentioned like the the connection with water, with Key West, with Leonard Bernstein taking the vacation there, but also your eclectic listening experience growing up, mm, yeah, and how that's now on this album. I think that's oh, yeah. pretty cool. And it I think is that relates to the unquiet part of that. Yeah, yeah, and you know Kevin Day, which for those listening, I would highly recommend you check out more of his music because he he's a jazz musician and a lot of his music is highly influenced by jazz music and you can hear that in the syncopation and the harmony um but unquiet waters it was inspired by a quote that spoke about um kind of how the mind relates to water like the waters of our mind and how it can be turbulent and when it's turbulent, it's difficult to see. And some at times things are still and everything's clear. And so the second movement is titled still and you can really hear it's almost like the, there, there's not one ripple in the water. And so you don't hear that in the outer outer movements. And so um, it's it's really special in that way. But yeah, I would agree. It has a lot to do with how I grew up and what I listened to. Yeah. And as we were saying beforehand, when I was listening to that piece, I felt like that that piece resonated with me i really felt mm -hmm. you know each of those movements and uh i would definitely encourage people to definitely check this out what's your what's your website by the way nickyroman.com so and you it, can yep so you can find a lot of things on there and by the time this episode comes out i'll have information up on the website about how you can purchase and stream it um but Yep. You can check out a lot of things that I'm up to on there. You can read more about my teaching on my website and a lot of different things I've been up to and uh, more about the album. Yeah. And one thing I also want to say about the album too, um, what's really great, two things. Number one, you're featuring works that may not have re recordings out there from before. That's really important. Yes. So you're exposing people to new music, but also you're featuring some uh, female composers as well, which is yeah. super important. That was very, very important to me. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I wanted it to be something that's accessible for students and to have also a resource for if they want to study repertoire, they have recordings to listen to. And a lot of these pieces are new. And I thought this is now a time that we need to get recordings out there so students can listen and learn. And that was really, really important to me. The other thing I want to make sure I mention is um, this CD wouldn't have been possible without uh the great university that I teach at because they fully supported this album and fully funded it, which has been oh, so wow. fantastic um, through what we call an ARC grant, an arts um, and advancing research and creativity grant. And so that has been uh, so, so helpful in giving this album a voice and making it come to life. So that has been huge. And I'm, I'm really, really thankful, thankful for them for seeing, um, seeing the importance of this album. So that's been huge. That the ARC grant, is that something that's local or is that something that anybody can apply for? Ah, it's something that is, um, it's a grant that is open to faculty at UW-Milwaukee if they have some type of creative project they wanna pursue. They fund things from CDs like this all the way through. Um, I had a percussion colleague who wanted to do a project on pieces for percussion and electronics and supporting equipment to make sure that happens and making sure um, students and professionals ca um, can see that project virtually from all over the world. And so they support a lot of really important projects, um, which I think is what's really great about this city is they really value art and different types of art and diverse art which is important. 
Eclectic again, eclectic, that, 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 that's the word that's coming to mind. Um, <laughs> before we go, can you talk about your work on the Committee on the Status of Women? And this is a NASA, uh, and I don't mean this, I don't mean the space. <laughs> <laughs> that joke always has to happen. <laughs> I know we got to do it, especially now with, you know, with the, the, uh, especially cause I'm, I'm near Pasadena. So with the, oh. you know, with the work on Mars, so it's, it's actually oh, yeah. very, very cool, but, but let's get back to the saxophone. So can you talk about this committee? <laughs> sure. So this committee formed, um, in, I believe 2018, uh, it, it's a part of the North American saxophone Alliance, which we call NASA. Um, and it was, really started to promote gender equity in areas related to saxophone and, and I think NASA specifically, because until then we hadn't had any form of a diversity committee. And, and since then, CSW has really served as a diversity committee, um, which is a lot of really hard work, but I think really important work. Um, I started actually as a volunteer with the committee um, prior to joining as a full member. And I helped a lot with kind of the social media and marketing, which at the time I had a huge interest in um, because uh, it was something that I did a lot as a student and like an early professional. And since joining the, the committee, uh, I think maybe a year, a year and a half ago, um, I've helped a lot with their online resources and a something we tried a lot to do, even pre-pandemic, was to provide resources for students and professionals, whether that be um, for women plus or for uh, in terms of allyship. And that was really important. And so uh, there's a lot of great things up on the website, like a feminist glossary. One of our members, Grace Jelpy, has been doing fantastic work with allyship tips, which come out ev almost every Thursday on our um, Facebook page, Committee on the Status of Women, uh, and just housing, uh, making sure that when you look at NASA as a whole, it you see yourself. And that is really, really important. And now the CSW has presented, regularly presents at national and regional NASA conferences, which is really great, um, whether that be presentations on our work or um, having open discussions. And then the other really fantastic component of CSW has been the mentoring program. And we've had some fantastic mentors and mentees. The first year it happened, um, it we had a mentee paired with every mentor and they kind of worked together uh, in whatever that student's interest might be or young professional's interest might be. And then this most recent mentoring program we had, which happened during the pandemic, um, with the help of the fantastic mentoring program leader, Dr. Jamberry Baker, um, the, the program was more project-based. So these students came out with fantastic projects, which you can see all over our Facebook page. Um, things like a, uh, working with school programs to make sure they have resources um, to be successful as young musicians, to kind of a name that tune series where students can vote in on Instagram and TikTok and the, the student kind of transcribes it and writes it out for the student to play along and just really fantastic. And wow. when you look at the lineup of mentors, it's just amazing. So the next iteration of the mentoring program should be announced pretty soon. So you'll want to be on the lookout for that. You can access CSW's website through the Committee on the Status of Women um, Facebook page. You can also go directly to the NASA website and go to committees and you'll find our website there. And I'm happy to send you the CSW website link. Um, but yeah, fantastic, uh, fantastic committee to be a part of that I think does some really important work. Oh, for sure. And, and yes, please send me that, send me those links. I'm going to also look on Facebook as well, but if you could send me those links, that would be great. I'm going to put this information in the show notes along with all of the other links um, that we've mentioned um, here, as well as I'm looking at my notes. This is this, Nikki, this has been amazing. I am so glad that Patrick reached out and I'm so glad I got a chance to, to listen to the music and how you play and just to have this conversation. This was really inspiring for me. Oh, thank you. This was, I always enjoy talking about these kinds of things. So thanks for having me. It was, I hope everyone enjoys, enjoys the CD. And um, yeah, it was really nice to chat and kind of talk about all things music, which is always a joy. <laughs>